Hey everyone, this is episode 242 of the Voluntary Viewing Podcast, recorded Monday, uh, January 22nd. We're trying to figure out if Scooby-Doo has ever uh, popped a gat, or if guns even exist in this universe. So, Scooby-Doo, where are you? There's a character named Beauregard Sanders yeah. from the episode A Night of Fright is No Delight. Um, because Scooby had to spend a night in the Confederate Manor in order to get the inheritance. Okay. I feel like I remember that. Yeah. The Colonel's lawyers creeps and crawls. I remember that. <laughs> Tried to scare their potential inheritors away during the night by dressing up as phantom shadows. They were able to catch the so-called phantoms, revealing that their hoax was for nothing, as the $1 million was worthless Confederate money. Okay, so the episode is called uh, SD Way, A Night of Fright is No Delight, and Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, I think is on HBO Max. Okay. Um, let's, because I have a Max subscription, we're getting on this. Oh, no, it's on Prime. Weird. Huh. Yeah, I... Thought for sure that was Warner Brothers. Maybe mm. they don't care. <laughs> no, original Scooby Doo is weird because that was originally produced by uh, CBS. Yeah, Barbera, Paramount. right? Yeah. Well, contracted through CBS. Got it. Okay, I gotta sign into my Prime account. I I am watching what I think is the clip from from that episode. I'll I'll put the uh, YouTube link in, in the, the chat. Time. I'm not I'm not convinced that there's guns here. I know that they shoot at the ghost with, uh, like, the corks of wine bottles. Oh, oh. wait a minute here. Uh-oh. I could have sworn that was a Civil War musket. Wow, you. I oh, yeah, no, this is the have... one where they, like, have the spring-loaded ironing board and they launch Scooby into the washing machine. And wait, is it Scooby-Doo, a... where are you? Or is it, what's new Scooby-Doo? This what's is Scooby-Doo, Scooby where, where are, you? are you? Okay, it's the original, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm looking for A Night of Fright is No Delight on Amazon Prime. I found it. Yeah, they're flying around on the washing machine with wings. Like you do. They, yeah, and then they catch the ghosts on the uh, clothesline. No guns. No, yeah, okay. And then there's I the fake under- Confederate right. money. Wow. That's my bad. I misremembered that one. They just said the thing you say when you fire guns, not yeah, firing that's guns. the meme. No, Scooby so... does, in fact, not have Big Blam Blam. Oh, wait. It is on Max. It's so fucking stupid, dude. Amazon almost... has it, but you need a Boomerang subscription in order to uh, watch it. So... I think almost all of Scooby-Doo is on Max now. Right. Which makes sense. Huh. Well, there no, you defi- go, guys. Definitely guns in uh, Mystery Incorporated, though. Scooby-Doo shooting a gun. <laughs> I mean, Scooby himself probably doesn't need a gun. Like I, like I said, no one... It just needs to be a gun. Even if it's on the table. Even if, like, they meet an old man who's got, like, an old tiny rifle. Something, you know? But we ain't getting that. We ain't finding it. There's no, like, prospector, you know, who's, like, got a... On, on, the, on the mantle... Above his fireplace, he's got like a rifle mounted up there or something, you know? Hold on. I'm trying to find a meme. Wait, like a meme of Scooby with a gun? I'm sure someone's done that. I think I saw a YouTube video. Uh, hold on. <laughs> There's a guy oh. named Will Williamson. Oh, okay, mine. here we go. Here we go. Ah, oh, it's Mystery Incorporated. God damn it, Andrew. Mm. There's a lot of guns in Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated. There is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. Is this Scoob and Shag? Yes, yeah! it absolutely is. Like, is that a gun? No. <laughs> Is this the original or? Yeah, this is before they got uh, weird with it. Okay. (laughs) Not weird at all. No. Dog eat dog. 
Interesting. That's a hell of a way to start. Mm. And the man who thinks that's interesting is Ryan Holtz. Ryan, if you were an NFL team owner, what would you do differently than all other NFL team owners? I would redefine what rebuilding is. No. <laughs> hey. um, but we do want to do that, right? Is that this podcast? We don't have to lead off of it. We got pod to fill. Pod to bring. We don't have to lead off of it unless you guys want to. Should everyone else be introduced first? Uh, Andrew, what would you do differently if you were an NFL team owner? Uh, do rebuilding better. Wow. <laughs> I would make myself a jersey, okay? That's where I was going with this one. Like, I don't know mm. why. I don't know why all that. You always see them in suits. You always see them in formal wear. No, you are infinitely more human and appealing if you, as an NFL team owner, just like, oh, you made yourself jersey number 100, and you just wear that, like, whenever you show up to work, whenever you're at a game at the stadium. I would have mine be my net worth. Oh. My number would be my net worth, and there's constantly a seamstress that is changing the numbers out as my net worth uh, goes up and down with the results of the game. Yeah. If your team loses, you... <laughs> You drop a decimal point. <laughs> That's, That's fun. Fair. All right. Andrew and Ryan had a fantastic conversation in our Facebook group chat the other day about what a rebuild is, what rebuilding is in the NFL, what constitutes as a rebuild season, um, if success is a metric in that or not. Uh, my inclination going into this conversation is yes. Uh although maybe the Packers have redefined that as they just had maybe a rebuilding season and did quite well. Uh, although Ryan might take umbrage with that. Um, let's start with so, Ryan. What is a rebuild? So Andrew, I think at one point got it into his head that I felt that a rebuilding season included a team being successful, which I definitely do not okay. like 100% not a thing. No, no, actually, I, I, think, I, I know what you mean by that. Um, yeah. I, I actually made a fun little Venn diagram last night because I was explaining <laughs> our discussion. Yeah, I know you can't see no, it's, it, it's, but I was explaining okay. this to Angel and I was trying to be like me and Andrew's definitions of a rebuilding year 100% overlap. Like there are plenty of teams that fall in the Venn diagram in the middle of the Venn diagram of mine and Andrew's definitions of a rebuilding year, mm -hmm. but there, as we have identified, there's definitely outliers on both ends that do not fall in those definitions, and that either of us might consider. I, although I think my definition is a little bit more inclusive, and then Andrews just has some teams that I definitely would not call rebuilding in his definition. So. But I'm uh, curious to see how it goes. Let the listeners know that Andrew has just taken off his robe. He's getting the, the the weighted clothes, the weighted robe to train is coming off. He's unleashing 100% of his power. I, I took off my robe and then the static electricity uh, traveled through my headphones and nice. fried my eardrums. Great. Yeah. Um, no. This is so, a this is a debate, not an argument. This is a very intellectual thing. We both agree. Yes, we are thinking that it's not real. Like this, yeah, it doesn't this definition matter. is not important and i want to lay it on the ground with that again i think about at least 75 percent of quote-unquote rebuilding years both of us would call a rebuilding year so we definitely agree on most things also it's it's not like a tangible thing it's it's not like right. at the beginning of the season like the they sit down and they all say okay guys we're rebuilding this year uh it, it's kind of just a thing that it's happening and like some people may agree on it some people won't like this year some people on the Packers team and in the Packers like front office said that we were rebuilding. Others said we weren't like it is. I, I think that I would call this a rebuilding year. I know Lucas said that it was Ryan. You disagreed. No, I didn't. Uh, I oh, very okay. much agreed. You also said this was a rebuilding. Again, year. This was a rebuilding year for the Green Bay Packers. So no, you. But you. I never did. La last night you said that like not enough change to this year for it to be a. Or by no, your never. definition, <laughs> you you were yeah you were saying that not enough changed for it to fit my definition. Yeah, and because I, your definition thought, is like, so focused on player movement. No, that not, I'm like, well, player movement and like coaching staff. And, okay, sure. Which and, then in that case there was no coaching staff changes. So right, but like <laughs> there were tons of fucking changes in in the players. Like no, no, in the coaching staff. Like if right, saying, no, but I'm but you said that there weren't staff. enough. You said there weren't any like changes 
like not there weren't enough changes in there the, weren't that many changes in the grand scheme i think there were plenty I it think was there were the plenty. main one was aaron Rodgers, and then it was just well it was the main one because it's draft. the most important player like sure yeah so so and but that's a big deal does, like a lot of right. the time if you change quarterbacks that's enough to constitute a rebuilding so we not need always to, we need but... to establish the definition for andrew clark if you lose or if you change your quarterback is it automatically a rebuilding season or no? Does there need to be a higher bar? Not it's auto. Not I'm not saying the Packers were that, but let's just say there was a team where literally everything stayed exactly the same except where they have a new quarterback. Is that a rebuilding? I would say not always, but most of the time. I I will say that when Brady joined the Bucks, I do not consider that rebuilding because he literally joined that team because it was built. Hmm. Tom Brady joined the Buccaneers because that team was built to be, hey, put a quarterback in here and you can win a fucking Super Bowl. Because Tom Brady's a system QB. Um, <laughs> Got to uh, get it in there. Yeah. Right. But but I think a lot of the time, like when you have a QB change, like that is that is a huge like swing for an organization. And that would usually constitute rebuilding, whether it's because you drafted, you know, your quarterback of the future or you just had like a, a you know, your long term quarterback retire or, you know, fucking whatever. Uh, I think most of the time that consider like I would consider that rebuilding. Yeah, I oh, think it's... what we agree on. Oh, sorry. No, Lucas, go. So it's swap out, swapping out of personnel with an unknown ceiling, basically. Well, so my actual definition of rebuilding is when there is a, a a lot of change within an organization whether it's players coaches or both that lead to the point of that season not being we are going to compete at the highest level possible but instead we are going to evaluate and see what we have so that we know what we need for the future yeah. you know this this and- year was a rebuilding year for the packers because you know, Gutenkunst refused basically to sign veterans because he wanted to see what the young guys had to know, hey, who's going to be around here for the long haul and who isn't like we I need see. to get these guys reps and we need to see them so that we know who's good enough to be a stalwart on the Packers next season. And then we go get it. And obviously it worked out a little bit better than we maybe thought even like three months ago. <laughs> a lot of it better. Yeah. Yeah. So the back half of that definition we're in total agreement on. Like a rebuilding year is a year where like coaching staff, management, everyone is focused more on, yeah, like player evaluation, looking ahead to the future, not really necessarily concerned with the results of this current season. If you win, great. But like, that's not the focus. The focus is more on understanding the assets that you have for the future. My difference is instead of it being about personnel changing and that is what makes it a rebuilding year it's more about the results of the previous season precipitating this change so if you you had a disappointing season and that made your next season now no longer really as focused on winning that year and more about looking ahead to the future so the packers and the reason i use disappointing and not losing is because the packers had a decent year last year but they missed the playoffs and we right. definitely expected to make the playoffs. So it was a disappointing season and that triggered a rebuilding year where we were more focused on evaluating talent and sure changes can absolutely happen, but that's not like what makes it a definition. So our Venn diagram is two circles where the common definition is the focus is not about like winning this season. It's more about player evaluation, looking into the future, but my end is disappointing results from the previous season and Andrew's end is like major personnel overhaul. That's, that's where, that's where I think our Venn diagram sits at. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew. No, I, I I think that is like, that's where you are and that's where I am. And yeah, there's a bunch of instances where both are true. So we can definitely agree on those being rebuilding years. I just think this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just think that, the reason that this was a rebuilding year wasn't because of the results of last season. It's what happened that made this team different than last year. What made why why did everything happen the way it happened? If the Green Bay Packers would have won a Super Bowl last year, do you think they would have been rebuilding this year? Or would they have brought a lot more people back and reloaded and continued to try to win 
more Super Bowls. Yeah, you're saying that if they would have won the Super Bowl, they wouldn't have rebuilt, but they didn't yes. win the Super Bowl. So they rebuilt. Like, but the yes. re- <laughs> but the rebuilding wasn't because of just the results of last year. It it's wasn't? <laughs> The the changes happened because of the results of last year. The rebuilding right. was because of the changes. The changes happened because of the results of last year. But right. but the changes had to happen for it they to didn't. be a rebuilding year. Yes, Why? yes they did. Why do okay. they? Okay, let, let me ask you this question, Ryan. <laughs> okay. You've got a restaurant. Yes. You're, Wait, hold on. You're... I want to throw this out there because I, I know that I got you more than once in these hypothetical scenarios and mine were focused on football you're now pivoting to restaurants but i'm curious to see where you go with this so you've got a restaurant okay you've you've got your staff you've got your host or hostess you've got your wait staff you have your chefs you got Mm -hmm. your bartender your restaurant is you know decorated in a certain way Mm -hmm. and a critic comes in Mm -hmm. you get a bad review everyone's real sad Mm -hmm. and you say hey i know we are better than this we're going to mm-hmm. keep doing what we're doing and, you know, we're not going to change anything. A month goes by. Literally nothing has changed. The The menu is the same. The staff is the same. The, the restaurant looks exactly the same. Nobody is acting any different. A critic comes in, gives them a, a review. It's outstanding. Mm-hmm. They liked what they got. Everyone's excited. Mm-hmm. Nothing changed. Did that restaurant rebuild? <laughs> Yeah, in this case, yeah, they absolutely no, did. No, they didn't. They didn't. They did not rebuild. <laughs> also, again, not it's not one to one. They did not do anything. Not one to one. They didn't do anything. <laughs> it's not one to one. How can you it's rebuild a... something that's already there? <laughs> First of all, the concept of being a critic is not like an actual like that. That is so subjective. There is an objective. It's measure called of an success. analogy, Ryan. That's what I'm trying to say, though, is that it's not one to one. Do you want to get into some one-to-one examples where I kind of caught you and I'm curious how you address them? (laughs) Yeah, sure. All right. By your own definition, the Detroit Lions were not rebuilding in the year 2022. But you yourself admitted that for the last two seasons before this one, the Lions were rebuilding. I went and looked at the roster. I went and looked at the coaching staff. The only major addition between 2021 and 2022 is Aiden Hutchinson. The entire roster stayed pretty much exactly the same. The entire coaching staff stayed exactly the same. I thought there was more changes. But apparently that was rebuilding. I thought there was more changes. So the Lions were not rebuilding last year. Because I would say they were. Like, they were rebuilding. Like, looking back at it? No, I don't think they were. That's crazy to me. But But you said they were. So I'm just going to throw that I, out there. So in 2021, your tune. in 2021, I think that they were rebuilding. And Definitely. by the end of that season, they, they had in place what they wanted to have in place. They they built their team. And then going into 2022, the team was built. And that that's not rebuilding. The, the team had been rebuilt previously, mm-hmm. and now they were just going and doing their thing. But but and, a team coming off a three and thirteen in one season, the Lions were not trying to win a Super Bowl in 2022. They were evaluating their young players. They were focused on getting reps for these younger players, seeing what they had for the future in 2021. Just in case, no, in 2022. I don't think so. What you just said, though, like you're changing your tune now, but you had said that for two years the Lions were rebuilding, and it's because I agree with you. They were not focused on winning that season. The the Detroit Lions, maybe they were lying to themselves, but let's be honest, in 2022, they did not start the season like, we're going to win a whole fucking Super Bowl, you guys. They were like, we got a lot of young talent and we look really promising. Let's see who's got it. Let's see who doesn't. And then next year, 2023, we might have something here. And look what happened. Like it worked out exactly that way. They didn't even make the playoffs. They went nine and eight. They had a pretty successful season by their measures. But they, they did not make really the playoffs. Games. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They didn't make the playoffs. They, But I don't think that they were upset. I think that they were like, hey, what a promising year. Let's get ready for next year. Same thing as the Packers this year. Definitely rebuilding, both by your definition and mine. Mine more that because we missed the playoffs, we had a disappointing year. So we had to focus more on evaluation this season. And we weren't necessarily like focused rock solid on winning a Super Bowl. And so it was a rebuilding year. But... That's 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 the first one where originally you had said that you've changed your tune now, now that you know that there weren't any personnel changes. But, but I think what we've established here is that the difference between how you see a rebuilding process or a rebuilding year 
versus how I see it is that you judge the results and I judge the process. I don't judge the results of the rebuilding season. I judge right. you, the results just, of the season prior. Right. So, but like, I don't see how any season following a disappointing season is a rebuilding year if they're not doing anything differently. If, because the co- it's about, like you said, it's about the mindset. It's about what the coaches and executives are doing. Are they making moves to try to win a Super Bowl this year? Or like you said, are they focused on getting <laughs> reps for young players? Are they focused on like trying to make everyone understand who the people are going to be moving forward to set themselves up better for future success? That's the main definition. I'm just saying what triggers that is a disappointing season the year before where you're now like, Ooh, let's lower expectations. Let's not try to win a Super Bowl. Let's make sure that we set ourselves up in the future. And it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with personnel changes. It can't. Have... A lot of times it does. A lot of times there are a lot of changes because, yeah, disappointing seasons. A lot of times teams are like, fuck this, and they nuke everything and blow it all up. And then it's also a part of a rebuild. So how about this year for the Bucks? Mm-hmm. You know, the or the uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, not the Milwaukee mm-hmm. Bucks. So. Brady, ret- let me make sure I get my timeline like correct here. Brady was still the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers last year. Last right? year, yeah. Okay, Jesus, that feels like forever ago. It does. It really um. Does. So, last year, Bra- Brady's last season as the Bucks quarterback. You know they they go to the playoffs, they lose. Brady retires. Mm-hmm. The team is mostly the same this year, other than, you know, you got your quarterback change. Mm-hmm. and uh you know no one really knows what's like what's going to happen going into the season because nobody's yeah. confident in baker mayfield yeah um and this i'm not trying to make a point i'm trying to see how you like feel about this right. they have the exact same result basically this year yeah. this in season was pretty shaky they still got to the playoffs they won a playoff game they lost uh to the lions and like looking back at the season, would you consider that a rebuilding year for the Buccaneers? Because last season was not disappointing. So here's, here's this where season we was obviously like the expectations were different. We might have found another differentiating point here. A rebuilding season is not defined after the conclusion of the season. A rebuilding season is defined at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. So the results of that season do not matter. The rebuilding season is defined in September. It is defined by the objectives of the front office and the coaches at the beginning of the year. And then, yeah, you could greatly defy expectations, which is why I threw the Rams 1999 year out there as the best rebuild ever, because they were at the beginning of the season not expecting to win a Super Bowl. They had a lot of young players that they were evaluating, seeing what they had, and Turns out they had a lot and they won the Super Bowl as the greatest show on turf, one of the best teams ever, won everything. That's to me a rebuild. So yeah, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 100% were, a re- were rebuilding this year. And even, then they did even though better than expectations. Season, even though last season was not a disappointing season. It was a disappointing season. They wanted to win a Super Bowl, 100%. So rebuilding is just you know, if you don't have high expectations at the beginning of the season. Yeah. High expectations and the approach of the front office and the coaches, like which we agree on is that they're, they're more focused on evaluating young players. And the reason for me that precipitates that is that they, they kind of got a reality check of like, okay, no, we were not, we were not going to win a Super Bowl last year. And we probably need to think about like, let's maybe win a Super Bowl in 2024 or 2025. And this, for the time being, we're going to focus on our young guys. I, but again, I, I would still not consider last season for the Bucks to be disappointing. And I would definitely say that they were rebuilding this year because of going into the season. They didn't know what they had and they had to figure that out. Right. But yeah. so, so you're but again, you, you said the main thing that changed. Well, well, again, we do agree that the Buccaneers were rebuilding. But again, you're saying the only thing that really changed was the quarterback. And previously you had said that that doesn't necessarily mean it's enough. Not necessarily, not always, but most of the time is what I said. Okay. Like, because uh, that's, that's not much change. That's like, there were like also said, some changes on the offensive line. Some, some veterans like retired and left and, and shit like that. Sure. But. I think my I I stand by that. I think sometimes you know bringing a discussion to the extremes is where you can find the core discrepancies. And I think my example, which I could just read verbatim, and I don't. There's no audience. There's not necessarily anyone that's gonna 
judge this, but I just, I really do think that I am in the majority with my example in saying that this, this example is not rebuilding. So a 12 and five team wins the Super Bowl. Their legendary quarterback head coaching duo ride off into the sunset. The head coach's young OC takes over the team and immediately hits the ground running by signing a big shot quarterback by some miracle of a contract dispute was on the open market, like Peyton Manning back in 2013 with the Broncos. Um, they then draft a couple of receivers, make a couple of big edge rusher signings and free agency, like they're going all in. They want to win a Super Bowl. Uh, and then they do it. They go 12 and five, once again, win another Super Bowl. Like to me, that is just not rebuilding 100% in no way is that rebuilding. They, but there's a they, ton of changes. There's so much personnel changes. They and completely you said, rebuilt the team. It is a completely different sure, team at that point. That's fair. But the rebuild did not happen in the season. The rebuild definitely happened in the off season. You cannot that's, call that a rebuilding season. I didn't say know? that. I never said that rebuilding is something that just happens inside of the season. i I think but the, I almost what we're entirely about. said that it's stuff that you do before the season starts to, to well, we're like talking see about, who you've got. Well, but how can you see who you've got until you start playing football? Until you start actually playing games, you can't yeah. evaluate talent. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right, so, so that's where rebuilding season comes into play. But if you get a bunch of established talent like in the offseason... So that wasn't a rebuilding season, it was just a rebuilding offseason. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, okay. genuinely. If the like, team, is, if really the team is. is rebuilt in the offseason, yeah. I'll, I'll concede that maybe a few of the letters of that sentence should be different. That it wasn't a rebuilding season, that it was a rebuilt season. That is, yeah, absolutely. Fine, that is a difference. I, guess. I think that the semantics came... there are pretty but this astronomical. All came... This all came from you not thinking that the 1999 St. Louis Rams were a rebuild because you were like not that much changed between the year they went for. I didn't know anything about that, like that team. I said that if talked about it, what what I said was that if they had like nine losing seasons in a row, they were probably rebuilding for a really long time. Yeah, they were. And I don't think that you should just say that was the rebuilding year. They were all rebuilding years. By my definition, all nine of those years were rebuilding years. They were like not in win now mode all nine of those seasons. And therefore they were in a rebuilding season for a long fucking time. Lions fans have been saying that all like during this entire postseason run is like my entire life we were rebuilding. And now we are finally in the like compete phase. And it's been 30 years. (laughs) So then the... If you're bad for a really long time, the first year that you're good, that's that's the rebuilding year. Because this is not a rebuilding year for the Lions. Like, no, it's, it's not. not. Yeah, definitely not. No, that's what I'm saying. When you're good for the first year, you're not. That's not the rebuilding year. All the years where the previous year was disappointing and you're not necessarily trying to win a Super Bowl. Those are all rebuilding years. Sometimes that can be like the Lions, 30 years straight right. of rebuilding But, it, but again, you also just said a few minutes ago that the Buccaneers this year were rebuilding because, I mean, which I also agree they were rebuilding, but you said it was because they didn't meet their expectations because they didn't win a Super Bowl. Yeah. That, that, that expectations is what, vary. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so were the Packers rebuilding all of those years that Aaron Rodgers couldn't get it done in the playoffs? No, that I don't think the Packers genuinely were trying to win a Super Bowl. The Packers were not all in. We we talk about that a we lot. We were trying about, to win a Super Bowl those fucking years. Yeah, we were. We, we talk about that a fucking lot about how we kept drafting random defensive players instead of desperately addressing our core area of need and that Aaron Rodgers literally fell out with the franchise because he was not we were not going all in like the Rams were like, that's talked about a lot is that we were not all in Super Bowl or bust this year. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers knew this is probably it for Tom Brady. Like, let's be honest. It's Super Bowl or bust. There is no point if we don't win a Super Bowl this year, like what are we doing here? And that that's the difference. So then they fell short. Coaches were reevaluating this whole season for the Buccaneers and yeah, they defied expectations and managed to make the playoffs barely like by some tiebreakers and shit and then won a playoff game because the Eagles are historically like just completely fell apart yeah dude what a what a fucking disaster class so I I, I don't think it's as impressive but anyway yeah Lucas can I posit a couple questions that might uh I don't know alleviate this or reframe it um yeah can rebuild season be triggered not by a disappointing season 
but by personnel having to be let go, having to be swapped out because of uh, contracts ending. No, that's what that's what Andrew's definition. Yeah, that's is. What you I'm you oh, just okay. summed up the argument for me. No, for Andrew, yes, in the alternate direction. Like you flip the question, and Andrew would say no. Like Andrew, if you asked Andrew, can a rebuild not just be from personnel changes year to year, but triggered by a bad season? Andrew would say no. So you you summed up the argument to where. I would say no the way you framed the question. If you flipped it, Andrew would say no. And that's where the core disagreement comes from. So it's tricky. No, absolutely. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out like what question to ask in uh, a tied to this podcast release to uh, get our audience <laughs> to engage with it. Um, Sound off in the comments below if, yeah. if you like name your favorite rebuilding year for your uh, sports team. And then kind of the... Yeah, kind of the question tied to this now, uh, after the Packers' performance, and I guess to a lesser extent, depend on, depending on who you ask, uh, the Buccaneers' performance, is a rebuild no longer an excuse for being bad? Like, do do fans not get that Kwanzaa anymore of, well, yeah, we were bad, but it's a rebuilding year. You're it not depends. supposed to be. Yeah, yeah I 100%. Mean, yeah, I mean, kind of depends on the extent of the rebuild. I mean, right. especially given my my definition like sometimes you have rebuilds that are like barely rebuilds and they're mostly just excuses to like not spend money on the team like oh we just want to see what this random fourth round rookie quarterback has to know if he's the guy in the future which he never is right um the the owen 16 browns following up the following season i don't remember what they went maybe like three and 13 no they, they they won one game Oh no no that was they was, they won they won one game the previous year yeah and then, and then they lost. went zero and sixteen yeah. so they went like one and thirty one in two years I think the season following they won like three games I think if you ask some Browns fans they'd be somewhat happy with three and thirteen like if you asked a Packer fan this year if we would be happy with three and thirteen I don't think you'd get a single person who would be no. happy with that result so it depends it depends on expectations as always and. Yeah, no, like, I think also, like Andrew said, it depends on, it can depend on, like, how much genuinely change. Like, if the Buccaneers, um, like, I don't even know, like, Lamar Jackson had some contract issues, and I don't even remember if he would have been available this offseason. Was that what it was, Andrew? Like, he'd be available to go to a different team for the 23-24 season? No, it would have it would have been last year. So last offseason, his contract expired, Okay, and then he got uh, transition tagged. Okay, um, so for yeah, for argumentative sake, if the well, yeah, that's kind of bad. And then he got his extension up for it. So. Yeah, the system's not set up for it. I, I guess we'd need like the Chiefs and the Chiefs murdered Patrick Mahomes' wife, <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> I can't play for this organization anymore. And the NFL granted him special exemption. He became a free agent effective immediately. And the Buccaneers made him a great offer, and they they signed Patrick Mahomes, and they immediately won a Super Bowl. Like. Yeah, I mean that that that'd probably be Super Bowl or bust for a lot of Buccaneers, and it's because you know they took one elite quarterback and traded him out for an even more elite quarterback, and nothing else really changed. And so expectations, if they then went seven and nine or seven and ten, even though it was a quote unquote rebuilding year, like I don't think people would be very fucking happy with Patrick Mahomes plugged into that roster going seven and ten. So. Yeah. I mean, it's all expectations. It's the reason that I don't watch fucking movie trailers or like any really like read anything about new outcoming media is because, dude, expectations are so important for the human experience. It's kind of terrifying. Like, yeah, knowing what to expect going into something taints your opinion of the outcome in such an insane way that like I, I don't even I don't know if it's been studied a lot psychologically, but the second I stopped doing that, I've started enjoying media so much more. I, so, I yeah. agree with that. And like, dang, this to a media thing, I think I can speak about a little more than football. Um, <laughs> yeah, that expectation thing also coupled with the fact that due to various capitalistic mechanisms um, and quite frankly, it being a lot easier and socially more acceptable for outlets just to kind of buy positive opinion from influential people. I feel like we don't hear... Th- Things aren't bad. Any things aren't allowed to be bad anymore in a way that is 
I don't know, kind of frustrating to me, kind of numbing to me. Um, I mean, yeah, it's I rare, it's but more... it does happen. Morbius. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's Morbin time. <laughs> it does yeah, happen. Morbi- it's just, it's pretty rare. Morbius people gave shit, uh, the new uh, Suicide Squad game, like even even the people who have made a career out of like being soft on uh, releases are like, oh, wow, this is advanced bad. Yeah. I, I think there's just so many mixed opinions on things now where like I'll see two people that, you know, consume the same piece of media and they have like completely opposite reactions. And it's not like why? Yeah, things aren't allowed to be bad, but they're also not allowed to be like any degree between bad and good. Nah. They have to be one or the other. And like, yeah, maybe I saw a movie and I thought it was just OK. And the other the person that I talked to loved it and they thought it was fucking fantastic. Those should be two valid opinions. But when one person sees it and they says it's the greatest movie of all time and the other person sees it and says that it is complete dog shit and the worst thing they've ever seen, that neither of those opinions can be true. Like there's <laughs> something else going on there like one this of, is very Blade Runner 2049. I, I know, <laughs> Ryan. I, I was trying to avoid it. I was trying to avoid it. But like, yeah, like th- things should be able to be like just okay or like pretty bad, but like could be worse or no. yeah, it's fine. <laughs> but like, I, I don't get that anymore. Yeah. The reason I stopped doing it entirely is because I just noticed that I wasn't liking things as much as a lot of my coworkers were. And it's because I was getting a lot of recommendations from my coworkers for things to watch. And they talk about how much they liked it. And then I'd amp up my expectations and I'd go in and be like, eh, it's fine. It does. Okay. It's not the greatest thing ever made. And when I go in blind to something with zero expectations whatsoever, like I don't, I like it a lot. Usually like, it's like, ah, I'm pleasantly surprised. Going into Saltburn with literally no idea what the fuck. <laughs> I didn't even know what the movie was about. I didn't read a log line. Like, it was, was, it was like, a fun movie about yeah. college hijinks. Yeah, I mean, if you trust yeah, some yeah. sources. But even that would fuck you up. Like, what if you really expected like, a college <laughs> yeah. romp and you didn't get that? You'd be fucked up. Like, you'd probably not like the movie as much. So having zero expectations, like literally not even knowing what it's about and just hearing, go watch it. That's That's the best way to to do stuff in my opinion like yeah. if if something is recommended to you by someone whose opinion you respect and you just do it with zero knowledge whatsoever before the fact you're you're way more likely to be like pleasantly surprised of just like yeah they did do this thing really well i didn't know much about asteroid city like i i stayed away from it almost entirely and lucas you just really liked it so as soon as i got a chance to watch it on streaming i watched it didn't even really know most of the Actors who were in it, I assumed there would be plenty of Wes Anderson mm-hmm. regulars and stuff like that. Had no knowledge of the plot. I had heard one thing against my will about like a play. So I knew that there was maybe like a story element of like it's a play. That's it. Yeah. And then I loved it. I was I was blown away. I was like, this is so good. I, I had so much fun. The characters were amazing. Like Wes Anderson, I, I, I understand like now revisiting the criticism from the past. I understand people saying it's Wes Anderson trying too hard to make a Wes Anderson movie. But I liked that. <laughs> like, <laughs> that made it fun for me. So um, I don't know. I'd, I'd recommend it. If, if, if nothing else, just try it. Like if you hear good things about a movie, but you don't really know anything about it, just try not researching and just going and seeing what happens. And I bet you, you'll be pleasantly surprised and you'll be a convert. Ryan, I think that has to be my approach to the recent uh, beta release of Pal World. <laughs> I just saw a TikTok on this like an hour ago. Because I am just dude. seeing every fucking opinion about, if y'all if y'all listening to this don't know, Pal World uh, had a trailer a while ago. Um, that led to people uh, referring to it as Pokemon, but with guns, uh, because that's what the trailer made it seem. Um, yeah, no, there are critters with guns or that you use as ammo in this yeah, game. Use ammo. It doesn't, it doesn't play like a Pokemon game. It's a lot more of a, like a, a resource management, like kind of a, a Minecraft, like community building, but you know, more focus on the violence, more focus on the critters, more focus on the, uh, like creating like, it's into- what Pokemon should be. <laughs> <laughs> Um, isn't it um it's made is it made by the guys who did arc or is it just like running on the same engine like i know that it's 
it's got ties to arc right the survival whatever it's called yeah arc. survival evolved right yeah survival uh, evolved something like that actually arc survival evolved is probably like the best point of comparison yeah. um thank you so it seems like that it seems like arc survival evolved but with pokemon and like a little more like cartoony like a little bit more like uh you shoot the fluffy ball and it explodes <laughs> like, right <laughs> you load it into your rocket launcher and he stares at you with sad eyes. <laughs> then you launch it into a structure, destroying it. Oh, so weird. Uh, so I think Power World is built in Unreal. I don't know if there's any overlap with Arc. Uh, let me uh, research that. Maybe it's the same developers. I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll I, I saw some people it. saying that the games were just wildly similar. I don't, oh, really? I don't know if there's any like developer overlap. It but... might just share DNA more more than anything. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, the reason it's making headlines now after release, um, on top of it being a very, like, SEO-friendly concept, uh, there are accusations that the developers just blatantly ripped off Pokemon designs for this game. Um, mm -hmm. And they did. Uh, whether or not that triggers a lawsuit, whether or not they are right to do that uh, is being decided in the discourse right now. But uh, yeah, no. No one's arguing that they didn't like. Uh, we're gonna make our slightly. We're gonna make we got Pokemon at home, Pokemon, and put them in our game and make them kill each other with guns. So yeah, it's just according to the CEO because they everyone's like, dude, you just you're ripping off Pokemon. Then the CEO said that they didn't even use Pokemon as one of the main inspirations, and instead the concept is based on Arc Survival Evolved. The survival me mechanics are based on Rust, and then Dragon Quest influenced the creature designs. And it's like I don't no, look, that, man, no, it these, didn't. these assets are clearly Pokemon. Like I just oh. I don't know what it, this, this and it's apparently the same company that did Craftopia, right? Which was Breath of the uh, Wild. So yeah, that was one of the Breath of the Wild clown. Um, mm. so that like look, this happens in gaming. Like you can just blatantly steal shit and get away with it if the game is good so we'll mm -hmm. see if it's good i mean it's still early access who knows if it'll ever actually get a final release but yeah yeah not like uh the was it the day before that that fucking shit show nightmare of oh, a scam yeah. game uh that was like the most anticipated game on steam for a while and it was a fucking scam <laughs> it wasn't real <laughs> It was so funny. Mm. Those servers just shut down today. It was like it existed for like five days and then shut down. And the beta people that had keys like were still able to technically play it for a few weeks. Mm. And then it is like now gone for good. Yeah. Video games, one of the most ephemeral media. Anything can happen, baby. There was that one kind of the OG Battle Royale, I feel like was... um. God, what was that game called? Day oh, one? Uh, H one Z one. Well, right? yeah, H one Z one, but that was a mod on Daisy. Uh, Daisy, no, no, Daisy was the mod, right? Our, our on... Daisy was a mod of Arma. Arma. That's yeah. what it is. Oh. Yeah, that came from Arma. It wasn't the standalone game? It was that um, Funhouse did a video on it, so then I bought it, and then they had to like re-release it a couple of times. But it's just like spears and shit from most of the game. Oh, um, um, was yeah, it day I know... one? N no why do i have day one in my head um I, I almost want to say the finals but that's a different game that just came out no yeah that one's uh controversial because it used um ai voice acting okay so we've got list of battle royale games which i like the culling the culling, oh! yeah. culling. so yeah. the the thing with the it was the culling 2 is they made the sequel and it was the one that only existed for a few days and then they had to refund everybody this is actually a fascinating Wikipedia article because it has, yeah, like list of battle royale games. Like clearly they all came from, yeah, like DayZ H1Z1, which was just an Arma mod. And that became really popular. They list the first one as Z1 Battle Royale, which was released as early access standalone mm -hmm. in January of 2015. And then The Culling came out in March of 2016. PUBG came out in March of 2017. Fortnite Battle Royale in July of 2017. So like, yeah, all these games are just iterations 
of like this thing and now it's such a major like genre of video games it's kind of crazy like apex legends wasn't until february of 2019 and it is now one of the biggest it's i don't know hey so like not to put my gamer cred on the line here um what do any of you guys know what fucking vampire the masquerade is no um okay if you don't i I don't think i do i kind i kind of do but not really i thought i i get it confused because there's vampire the masquerade there's um is it called uh vampire the survivors and then there's one that's called redfall which is something else but one of See, one of those games is a vampire battle royale, mm. and then and one is a like a single player story based game. I'm seeing Vampire: The Masquerade as a tabletop RPG, but that's probably not. Oh, okay, that the so the video games about. take place in the universe, or okay, Vampire: okay. The Masquerade is apparently a whole multimedia franchise um, that has a dedicated fan base because I keep hearing about it, but never see it out in the wild. Uh, they have a battle royale. Um, also, according to this Wikipedia page, no new battle royales in 2022 yeah. or 2023. Yeah, I did notice mm. that it like very ostentatiously stopped updating at the end of 2021. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. I feel like they just stopped updating this page. But um, oh, Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt is the battle royale, which is based on the tabletop video game Vampire the Masquerade. Um which is also then like has spawned other video games. We could update this page. Newest battle royale games. I mean, like, so example, they have Call of Duty Warzone. What what do they call it now, Andrew? Is it still Call of Duty Warzone? I thought it had a new it, name now. It's War well, Warzone 2.0. There you go. Warzone 2.0. When did that come out? I feel like that that's a thing but then like so does it have to be it's like the entire game is just a battle royale because remember cod had a battle royale game mode as part of i think that's in here i I think that's in here because i saw warzone and what was it called again it had a it was was black 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 out yeah Yeah. they have it on the list so yeah i think it could be a game mode of them as long as it's like fully fleshed out and actually has like a user base i just want to see where there's got to be something that released in 2023 and 2024, right? Well, yeah, when did uh, Blood Hunt come out? <laughs> oh, wait, did it actually? I don't know. Oh, no, it came out in 2021. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I, Hey, top of Google Darwin result, Project. 2023 Battle Royale games, Off the Grid, Dead Side Club, Deceive Inc., Grit, uh, Prison City. Whoa! The fi- oh, the finals came out in 2023. That's not a battle royale. That's just a shooter. Oh, I don't even know what the finals is. I've never heard of it. Is it? Do they not have a battle royale game mode? No, it's like one game mode. Huh. Um, What's Far Light 84? Fun. When did that come out? You guys familiar? Far Light 84. Far Light 84 released in 2023. Huh. There you go. Shooter game in a wasteland setting developed using Unreal 4. I this subset of Wikipedia admins, Wikipedia contributors, slacking. Yeah, Farlight 84, dudes. Clearly. Clearly the superior. I don't, I've superior never, Royale. I've never played it. Honestly, they all had moments for me, but I think I'm good. Yeah. Is that just me? Maybe it's just that we struggled so much in Warzone before we quit, Andrew, but like Every every major, major Battle Royale game, including Apex Legends, had like brief moments for me. Some of them less brief than others. But I think I'm good now. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't need more. I mean, I don't know if it that it feels like Warzone is easier now than it used to be. Or just like, like the competition has gone somewhere else. But... Yeah, it it feels more of like just a way to kill some time. It doesn't right. like it's not exciting. Like I I like routinely, not routinely, but like, you know, at the point when I was playing like Warzone a little bit more frequently over the last few weeks, I got like half a dozen solo wins. And I just when I won, I went, "Ooh, 
<laughs> like when when we won our first fucking Fortnite game, we went bonkers. Do you remember Andrew? Because you, I was like a somewhat early adopter of PUBG. PUBG, I remember you. You would come over in college. I was. We would take shaking. turns. Shaking, like yeah. When I won that first game of PUBG, I was fucking shaking and sweating. Like I couldn't calm down for a really long time. I still you don't, have you don't it. get that anymore. I still have it recorded on my PC. I was recently looking for a video file for my brother and sister, and I f- I was sorting by largest file size, and I was like, "What is this?" And then I rem- I saw the the silent UMP, and you were just prone in the middle of the desert, just like crawling, and then you heard some gunshots above your head, so you like stand up and just spray the fuck out of this the last guy. And you have like a sliver of health left, but he dies and it says winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> and the mouse just like starts fucking freaking out. And I was just like, I remember this. Like Andrew would literally come over to my apartment and we would just take turns playing PUBG because we had no way to do it multiplayer because I was the only person with a gaming PC. And that was fucking great. And then Fortnite came out and like everyone got it. You know, it became like a game for yeah. all of your friends. And it wasn't just like a for PC gamer type thing. And we had a lot of fun with that. And then Warzone came out right as COVID hit. And it was like, holy shit, this is perfect. This is is what we do now. This is, yeah, like PUBG was buggy as fuck and like kind of awkward to play. Fortnite was way too cartoony and wasn't as like shootery. It had a lot of building elements. Warzone was like, this is a polished, like triple A fucking battle royale game and it was perfect and it came out at the perfect time and we played the fuck out of it and now i'm good and and then there were points during covid where like someone was like dude you gotta get on apex legends it's so good and i would like download it and played some fun yeah game. who was that some that weren't eh, guys from high school and everything huh. like that. and, and oh, i played like a us. few games that were pretty fun oh did you oh yeah andrew you did get into apex yeah. no, and, and lucas Luke, oh, lucas yeah, together yeah. a lot yeah that's fair i didn't play too much with you guys i remember but yeah, and it was fun and we had a good time. But now I don't know. I think I think we're we're good, right? We don't we don't I don't need it in my life. Like I'm yeah. not like, man, if they just fix this thing, this thing, and this thing, I'd be sucked right back in where this would be like most of my time. It's Which is why not... foam stars is just enough of a change to the formula to get us hooked for it's zero what we dollars. Need. It's what we need. I've been getting a lot of Battlefield One content recommended to me, so I'm still huh. I got I got a Battlefield One hook in my heart. I think I'm watching people with the Martini Henry Andrew. Mm-hmm. You see, have you seen that fucking gun? What the yeah. fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's just one hit kill. Like... Yeah, and, and and if they've taken like any damage, one hit kill at, on any part of the body, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's a and it's a, a, a an iron sight weapon. I was like, holy shit. This is awesome. I want to do this, knowing I won't be nearly as good with it. But yeah, foam stars. What's that about, Lucas? Heli- or elevator pitch? I almost said helicopter pitch. That <laughs> oh, helicopter. Oh, I don't yeah, know. No, what helicopter that pitch is you have to sell me on this, and if you don't, I push you out of the helicopter. Why would you shoot a man before throwing him out of a helicopter? <laughs> Uh, so Foam Star seems to mechanically be very similar to the video game Splatoon, where you are more marking territory, but also able to uh, temporarily kill other players. Pretty much. Can you I'll... choose the color? Can you choose yellow? <laughs> uh, I think you will be able to choose the color. Ooh. Um, I feel like yellow and white would be very popular colors <laughs> for somewhat obvious reasons. Uh, but then instead of, you know, this taking place in a dystopian weird universe where squids are kids, uh, you're playing as influencers competing in a Mr. B style competition in not Las Vegas. There you go. What is a Mr. Beast style competition? You fucking know. Squid you games. fucking know. It's a is thing. Apex Legends a Mr. Beast style competition? <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> is it is like any you... game show a mr beast yeah. style competition well how survivor like... this yeah, mr. Beast style mr beast style competition deal or no deal island no oh, god beast what, style listen, competition. like what level of like lack of self-respect is there you know <laughs> that's what the <laughs> defining character is yeah, yeah. squid games the challenge is the ultimate lack of self-respect <laughs> challenge yeah. there you go no nah. Interesting. Have you guys seen any of the recent Fortnite memes with like, because you can sing now 
like your emote can be like playing musical instruments and like singing and you can like get a band together by like assigning all of your squad different instruments and stuff and like do a concert in the middle of a Fortnite game is that just me i've uh, not seen that i've seen peter griffin in Fortnite. yeah, yeah. so He's people have, people have abused he is jacked yes um people have abused this mechanic because they put mr brightside into the into the game and you think that's fine right like that's a very popular song. It makes sense they'd license that, and that would be one of the main songs that you can play. It's rock. You know, there's a lot of instruments and everything. Um, what they do is they divide the vocals up into parts. So you select them like an emote, and then you can, like, if you sing them correctly, it'll play perfectly in line, and then you can have someone on the guitar, someone on the drums, everything like that. Um, I saw a troll where they downed a guy and him and all of his squad mates ran up to the down guy because in Fortnite you don't really have self revives in the same way. I think they recently introduced them, but like, yeah, not really a thing. It's more like you could torture someone who's downed and they have no way out, basically. And they also have the the shaker bottle now where you can like spray champagne on all your friends, but it looks a little sus. Like you're you're like shaking it up and then just like dousing all your friends with liquid. Um, so if that guy starts shaking and then the guy selects the lyric to, for the start of Mr. Brightside. Do you know the lyrics, the first two words of Mr. Brightside by any chance? Lucas, I'm, I'm Andrew? coming. I'm yeah. coming. Yeah. So they just did very, it over and over. It's like, I'm coming, just, I'm coming, I'm coming. Just canceling. Um, and then another guy also had another song, which I don't even know what it is, but it starts with like a grunt. <laughs> so it's literally just, I'm coming. Uh, and it's just a guy spraying shit. I'm coming. Uh, spray. <laughs> like, and, and I'm just like, this is like, this is a child's game. This is this is made for babies. <laughs> and this is what these assumedly at least like 16 year olds are just roaming around the Fortnite landscape doing to people. Cy- <laughs> cyber bullying people. Yeah. Just sexually hurt, assaulting people, essentially, <laughs> in a video game. It's um yeah, it's really something, man. <laughs> the creativity of this generation. I don't know who came up with that, but yeah, when I first, I was like, oh, Mr. Brightside, that's fun. And I think I scrolled three TikToks down and found that one. It was like, I, I didn't think that through and neither did the Fortnite devs <laughs> to make that the top of one of the vocal tracks. <laughs> so, Oh God, I made the mistake of going onto the Fortnite wiki Fortnite has a lore now. Yeah, it's always had lore. But it's bad was... lore. Like there was an yeah, organization. Yeah, it's always been bad lore. What? <laughs> yeah, there's like time travel and dimension shit and superheroes well, Fortnite, and Fortnite wasn't Thanos. battle royale. Fortnite was like it was in a PVE like right, base yeah. building like shit. So originally it had yeah like an actual lore story and everything. And then the battle royale has its own lore that stemmed from that and branched outwards to yeah where it's now pretty insane like apparently there was an organization in fortnite just called the society there you go Mm. uh and its members include valeria montague oscar who is a cat man peter griffin and solid snake solid snake is in fortnite solid snake is in fortnite wow yeah I didn't see you ripping on Kojima for that one. Uh, it's it's getting to shit post territory, right? Where like if you were to show me a picture of five random characters and tell me, yeah, and they're all in Fortnite, I'd be like, okay. I mean, I... Nicki Minaj and uh Homelander are in <laughs> Warzone. Not it's... a character that Nicki Minaj plays. Uh, just oh, Nicki, Nicki Minaj, Minaj, yeah. Well, Nicki Minaj. Has, I don't think she's ever like done any acting. Like I think she's just Nicki Minaj. <laughs> there's no, there's no characters I'm there. Nikki. Is is Peely in the lore or is he just? I just went to Peely's page. Yeah, me too. has a lore section on his okay. page. Um, Peely is literally a banana with human arms and human legs. Uh. Great lore. <laughs> season eight. Is literally 
Whittle, Whittle wheel, wheel banana. banana with arms and legs. <laughs> Season eight, Peely goes through the ripening ritual. Oh, and oh during that's his lore. banana hood, he meets Jonesy the first, and the two become best friends. That's lore. Season nine, after escaping from the volcano eruption with Jonesy by hiding in a bunker, the duo notice there's no food left in the bunker. Bunker Jonesy. Different than Jonesy, I guess. Very different. Turns him into a smoothie to sustain himself, keeping both him and Peely alive. I think I remember seeing that. And so the lore, I think, is just what happens in the trailers for the new season. (laughs) I saw that on a commercial. I remember because I'm like, oh, there's a guy in a bunker with a banana and he drinks him up. (laughs) Peely. Okay. (laughs) So they have reactive skins on Fortnite, apparently, where like throughout the match, they can change as the match okay. goes on. So Peely starts the match as like a brighter green, like unripened banana. And by the end of the match, he's got like brown spots and is like gone bad. So wow. that's fun. They also have this promotional image of like a bunch of different Peely alts, which I'm just going to send you a link because I think one of them, I guess he's wearing swim trunks, so... Not as inappropriate, but it is a little weird, the implications of these various skins, I would say, if you, if you open the Zoom chat. I... So one of the latest Allure entries is that there is a young banana born. Uh, I'm hmm. not seeing genitals on Peely. How do we think Peely reproduces? Well, that's what I was saying. If you if you look at that image, there's a peely without the peel, yeah, and he's and he's still alive. I'm assuming. Like if you if you did a version of that skin with a human, they it would be a horrifying muscle blood monster, right? So I guess those are clothes. The peel is clothes. Is that what that's implying? I mean, he. He is a banana. I don't think that there are further implications we need to dive into here. I think you do, Andrew. I, think, I don't I think, think you Peely reproduces. To. A banana doesn't so, reproduce. A banana yeah. tree makes bananas. From clippings. Because all bananas all bananas that we eat are genetically identical. They're all yeah. trimmings from other banana plants, which is why they're yeah. unbelievably vulnerable to like yeah. a, a no, strain. If, if, there, is, if there is a like, banana disease, like yeah. we could We're lose fucked. every banana. And that's why banana candy uh, doesn't taste the same as bananas is because Mm -hmm. banana candy was invented before we reached modern banana status and they taste like the old bananas that we used to eat. And yeah, yeah, no, it's kind of fascinating because it's it's from like the 20s and shit when we had real bananas that weren't just all one super sweet, like specific banana. Isn't there that rare blue banana though, that people says tastes like ice cream that I'd like just have a hard time believing. I don't, I'm, yeah. I mean, like I'm that, not that's saying it's a different, the only it, strain. Yeah. It's the only like, mass produced strain. How about? Yeah. Okay. Guys, I think I found an inconsistency in Peely's lore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so apparently it is a canonical fact that Peely has banana claws okay similar to wolverines okay but like bananas come out of his hands yes and, okay however those are made out of banana and in the undead skin it is clearly shown that peely has a skeleton yeah that's what i'm saying there's right? so many implications here there should be regular bones coming out of there peely it's like the implication of uh, Frankenstein uh, in Rick and Morty going to the afterlife with still all of the pieces of different people right. <laughs> attached to him, but the other monsters are the the human versions of themselves. Right. It's like I, I really wish we had enough time to stay here and talk about the implications <laughs> of Frankenstein still being all of his pieces in one guy. Do you have a new soul? Do we make a new soul when you get stitched together? What's going on? Souls aren't real, Lucas. No. <laughs> Frankenstein's uh... monster. Very real. Souls. Come on, man. Grow up. <laughs> uh, we're getting on in this one, so we don't have to talk about the drama that is Ohio Con. Um, just go read that article on Anime News Network. It is fantastically uh. written and also the exact blend of drama, the exact perfect blend of drama that I never thought I would see between 
anime drama, otaku drama, people being petty in that way, and Midwest drama and people being petty in that way. The roller coaster ride I just went on because I was off the page looking at something else when you said the word Ohio con. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's a con about Ohio. That's fucking dumb. And then I opened the planning document, saw that it looks like like Ohio con, like a Japanese word. And I'm like, oh, it's like an obscure anime or something. And then I clicked the article and no, it's an Ohio anime convention. So they're spelling it that way intentionally. And it is yeah. Ohio. Yes. So fuck this shit. <laughs> wow. Fuck Ohio. I think the I think the Japanese pronunciation is Ohio. Yeah. Not not Ohio. It's Ohio, but like it looks like yeah, it's, it's a, a play, it's a play on words. words. It's yeah. a play on words. I think it's funny. <laughs> no, I'm saying Got fuck him. this shit as in the convention. That's bullshit. Uh, fuck this. Uh, well, the, the short of it is that it's not happening. So you get what Yay. Yeah. Nor should it. You can't just do I I don't even know what the Japanese version of Wisconsin would be like it. I don't know. I can't even do it. Fuck that, though. You can't do it. California anime? Nope. Yeah. You know what? You know what, you... Ohio Con? You can't do that. You can't name it that. You also can't use the Red Cross logo in your logo. That's a <laughs> war crime. Yeah. That's against the Geneva Conventions, which if... is they were doing, if you read the article. If there's a Japanese anime company... That decides to make an anime set in fucking Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> then sure. <laughs> but otherwise, no. You don't get that, Ohio. That's not for you. <laughs> I'm trying to think if they ever go to Ohio in JoJo's Bizarre. No. Okay, they travel through it. But we are blessed with the miracle of not seeing Ohio in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. We see Milwaukee though. Yeah, I was going to say, is there an extended period of JoJo's where they're traveling around the United States? They yeah, they do Milwaukee? a Milwaukee? Yeah, they do a cross-continental race. In in that part, there's briefly a stretch where two of the main characters are the richest people in Milwaukee and are having a terrible time. Because, like, Japanese people don't know anything about Milwaukee, so they're saying, let's pick an obscure city and, like, make it a kind of like weird reference uh, how many people in japan do you think are aware of the existence of a city called milwaukee because like as someone who doesn't spend much time thinking about japan i know that like i probably know about three or four cities and beyond and maybe that's just because america is so fucking like centered yeah. on itself but like i definitely uh, would not be able to name japan's equivalent of milwaukee <laughs> So I'm curious what percent are even like aware that it's a city that exists and is real. Because it's what? It's like number 19 in the US? Or is it even that high? So my only thought is that how big is the NBA in Japan? Mm, Milwaukee Bucks. True. Yeah. Milwaukee I feel, Brewers. I feel yeah. like if, yeah, I feel like if the reason you know it is because of sports, like. That counts. It counts, but. <laughs> If like, you don't know anything about the city, sure, it taints it a little bit. But, hey, I think that's how a lot of people are introduced to cities in general. Okay, um, Milwaukee is the 31st biggest city in the United States. Higher than I Japanese, thought. Japanese. Well, I thought it was 19, so I'm way off. Yeah. Uh, by population, let's get to number 31 and see if any of us have heard about it. Oh, the 10. God damn it. Investor give us a range, monitor. though. Give a give us like a range of like five to see. If no, we'll... it's got to be thirty one on the top. Specifically, th well, like what if we know? What if we've heard of number thirty two, or thirty? Um, um. Oh fuck! God damn it! Do you know it? Thirty first biggest city in Japan, Nagasaki. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, that that actually like. Shock to me. <laughs> I, oh, that was a jump scare. Jesus. Milwaukee's Japan Japan equivalent. It's fucking I guess. So. Jesus Christ. That was a jump scare. <laughs> oh my god. What? Oh fuck. Are you joking though? Like no. Nope. You need to cite your sources here because <laughs> I that's a stand-up bit, like what you just did. That's so bad, dude. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> According, boy, put some stuff in perspective. According to city mayors, okay, that's something. 
It's a website that exists. Huh, Hiroshima is number 11. Yeah. Isn't that right? It's not a terrible comparison, too, because Nagasaki was targeted because it was somewhat remote and yeah. was like a big manufacturing hub. Yeah. So <laughs> not not Milwaukee, like maybe uh, Detroit. Uh, Milwaukee definitely had a ton of manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't like the heart of manufacturing, but I I don't think Nagasaki was either necessarily. Mm-hmm. Wait, so where's the shit? Did you link your sources? Okay, here we go. Yeah, I got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Why there can I not no- find it? Number 31. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the surrounding cities, yeah, like nope. Matsudo, Himeji, Matsuyama, Kanazawa, like never in Not my a life. chance. But 31 on the dot. <laughs> Jesus, man. <laughs> it's so bad. That's so bad. Wow. Boy, that reframed some shit. Uh, Got to rewatch Oppenheimer now. They're not dissimilar in population either, by the yeah. way. Like looking at the population, mm-hmm. that is uh, yeah, less than five hundred thousand. Yeah. But like, it's a that's not tiny within spitting distance. Wow, Milwaukee really is America's Nagasaki. God damn it! God fucking damn it, dude. Hey, so what are you guys watching or playing or reading or shit? Um, I just watched Chinatown earlier oh. today for the first mm. time. What'd you think of it? Uh, I thought it was really good. Um, I had heard that the ending is like very bleak and I didn't really know what people meant by that. And yeah, it is. It kind of it kind of just fucking ends and like, ooh. Sorry for clarity. This is the 1974 film. Yep. Ah, look at you. Look at you. Check it. That's a goal of mine. That was a tangible goal of mine this year that I want to watch like more old media, more like foundational media. Yeah, I've tried to like focus the last few years and like just like seeing stuff that came out that year kind of because of the podcast list. Right. And I, I feel like I'm limiting myself. So yeah. I want to branch yeah. out. I winter months. Great. Uh, great time for that. Yeah. Jack Nicholson was great in that shit. Like, what does he look like? He, like, is he still he, like... he looks like Jack Nicholson, but oh, you know, younger. No. Like he, I mean, he's, he's got the high eyebrows. He's got the voice. <laughs> But he's got I mean, when voice. when did The Shining come out? That was what early eighties. Yeah, so it was like, like eighty two, a little younger than that. Like, oh my god, yeah, it's just it's him, but less like face sag. Yeah, yeah, huh? It's weird. Jack Nicholson, but younger. Like, it's... I that's yeah, but like Jack Nicholson looks so much like Jack Nicholson that it's weird to huh? Yeah, all right. Guys, I hate to tell you this, but I enjoy the Ted show on Peacock more than wow. I should. Yeah. Mm. You got a Peacock subscription? Uh, Yeah. Uh, Maria and I were doing a 30 Rock rewatch, and I just kind of let it oh, keep is going. Is that only on Ted. Peacock now? Yeah. Jesus. What have you taken from us, Universal? The golden days of Netflix over. Although I think they have Seinfeld. Um, yeah, no. Oh, it... yay. <laughs> Fucking Seinfeld. Yeah, I just watched an episode of Seinfeld on Netflix today. <laughs> oh, which one? Um, the one where uh let's see. Um Jerry has the rental car. George is like like parking all of the like neighborhood cars, yeah. like moving them around and causes like gridlock, and then Elaine is dating an old guy who has a stroke, and Kramer is uh trying to act in a Woody Allen film. <laughs> and then these pretzels are making me thirsty. It's a classic. No. Jason Alexander, who's a very accomplished and very talented actor, playing a character who can't, who act. can't act, doing his absolute fucking best. It's impressive. Like it's it's hard to pull that off. Wait, do you mean uh Max Powers? He played Kramer. No, oh, but no. in, in the episode, like Kramer yeah. got a role in a oh, Woody okay. Allen film and George is mad and was like trying to show that he could act Ah, and fail. I see. These yeah. pretzels are making, making me, me thirsty. thirsty. Just like terrible. You don't know how long he's been at that bar. Maybe he's been there all day. He's depressed because he's got no job and he can't park these cars. And he doesn't <laughs> know what's going on. Those pretzels are very, very thirsty. I. 
that is god i i love that episode i love that george bit well i love every george bit but that one especially because that is such a men failing kind of thing like every man thinks he could do that every man th- oh yeah i could totally move cars or i could park cars i could switch from the side of the road this could be my side hustle and then faced with the actual logistics and stress of that and just grumbling uh i love it i george very well uh well written character did you watch 30 rock recently uh yeah like halfway through season three. No, oh, damn you know, so you're not done yet it's still New. might still not happening. ever be done petering out oh. a little bit especially with mm. the sopranos that always happens or happened to me for 30 rock i started watching it like freshman year of college and i don't think i finished it until like 2018 2019 like it took me like five years to watch from beginning to end i would always like fall off for like months and then come back to it and always really enjoyed it i just <laughs> sometimes would stop watching and it never made any sense and then at one point in like 2018, I just felt like I completely fell for it and watched yeah like two and a half seasons and wrapped it up. But mm. did you get to <laughs> me and my coworker recently? I've just been quoting it like crazy. Did you get to uh, Jackie Jormp Jump? The... No. Oh God, Jenna. Jenna... <laughs> I need to pull it up because it's the funniest fucking shit, dude. Like Jenna. Um gets into or she's she's playing in a biopic because she's trying to win an award uh she she's playing janis joplin but halfway through they don't they lose the rights to the story so it becomes uh about jackie jump jump no so they <laughs> i saw the like episode that sets a lot of this up in the first episode she's set to play janis joplin but yeah. then they lose the rights uh yeah. they get out it so then it's like playing janice joplin yeah and then later it becomes on, jackie to- jump jump and it's i see it's season three episode 18 so you, they were setting up for an episode that i don't think you've seen yet that is yep. oh dude it's fucking amazing like it is the funniest shit ever <laughs> like the all the songs are just like slightly altered versions of janice joplin's song dude that show's really fucking funny I know that there's parts that probably didn't age all that well because it's aughts comedy, but man. No, there is the amount of casual transphobia in early 30 Rock, at least, is kind of every show. Back yeah, now. every no, comedy that, it... show. Yeah. Yeah, weird. Yeah, if it was a if it was a like de jour show or movie, like if it was like of the culture, then it's just straight yeah. up homophobia. If it's like kind of a progressive pushing the boundaries show, then it's transphobia. Like yeah. that's the they've moved past homophobia and are to transphobia. And one day they might actually it, just stop. But uh, it is also at uh, Thirty Rock is also aged really in a really interesting way because a lot of I don't know, a lot of the stuff that Liz deal was with as like a high profile woman working in entertainment, working in a public position. Um, A lot of the things she has to deal with still super relevant, but also she has just become the most neoliberal cutout as time has gone on Um, in a way that also ages really interestingly with uh, yeah, public perception of Tina Fey and some of her humor. And yeah. Um, also, I won't pop off too much about the Sopranos because everyone knows the Sopranos is good. Go watch the Sopranos, everyone. Um, an underdiscussed part of how good it is: the dream sequences <laughs> in the Sopranos are a cut above it. They're they're weird and unsettling and surreal in a way that you don't think like a grounded, a pretty grounded piece of media like the right. Sopranos is going to be. But then, I don't know. I just watched the season two finale and there's a dream sequence where they just strapped a dildo underneath James Gandolfini's pants as he goes to his therapist's office. And it is hilarious. <laughs> uh, yeah, good show. Yeah. No, it, it is sometimes unsettling mm. <laughs> to be drastically jerked from this hyper-grounded mob like blue collar the fucking violent show to like just straight fantasy yeah 
He straight up fantasy. He learns one of his best friends is uh, on the take from the feds because a talking fish in his dream tells him. <laughs> hey, mm. things things come to you with mysterious ways. I don't know. <laughs> Ryan, you got uh, you got anything new you're checking out or uh, puppy prep taking up a lot of the bandwidth? Yeah, definitely a lot of puppy prep going on. I'm going to be welcoming Mochi, the mini hey. Australian shepherd, in about a week and a half here. And uh, going to be having a blast, hanging out. So yeah, then probably even less. But yeah. no, I've been trying to watch like movies and TV shows, but similar to Andrew, I'm like, ah, I kind of want like stuff from 2024. And yeah. hasn't been much lately. No, I really Doesn't want Severance been... to come back. Like that was a good like, you know, have like capturing cultural moment. Everyone watching the shows. Yeah. As much as we did when Game of Thrones is on, and Severance is about as close as it comes to that, I feel. It's not yeah. going out until was the 2025. Last time, when was the last time all three of us watched the same show at the same time? Yeah, Rick and Morty kind of, but not really. Yeah, Rick yeah, and Morty, the... we never really lined up. No. We'll watch House of the Dragon no. season two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, There's never been a show that everyone watched <laughs> and and got to comment on as a culture since Game of Thrones. Well, there was that one time they made a show in the same universe. They, yeah, and it there was, was the one time where they made Game of Thrones watched. again, but good. <laughs> like, and we all had the opportunity to watch it. And there was there was that one. But hey, yeah. speaking of disappointment, that Packer game kind of knew it was coming, but still. Not disappointed at all, baby. No, yeah. I'm riding high. I don't care. D- definitely Literally. disappointed in the moment. Like, nope. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we shouldn't have been there. You know, it, like implications going into the next season are great. I feel good. But like, yeah, like we we gave that game away. Like we we absolutely like played better than the other team should have put it away and didn't. Like we we lost a very close game that you know. We gave away the opportunity to go to the NFC Championship and play the Lions, which would have been fucking cool. <laughs> like that, it sucks, but you know what? Like, I'm not gonna eat myself alive for it. Also, like, unless hey, unless you got a team in the game still, and you, eh, yeah, unless you got a team in the game still, you're be rooting for the Lions right now, okay? Yeah. Like they are America's team. Yeah the the, the prospect Lions. of having a like Chiefs 49ers Super Bowl is just yeah gut wrenching <laughs> yep nope ravens lions all the way yep but no i don't know if i said it during our zoom call or afterwards but no I, there was literally not a single point in that 49ers game where i thought we were going to win the game we never huh? extended the lead to like a far enough distance like when we were up 20 to 0 against the cowboys i didn't think we were going to win yet <laughs> i think after the pick six when we went up 27 to 0 was when i was like Oh, I think we're going to win. Like, But against the Niners, there was literally not a single point where I was like, we're going to win. I was always like, ah, we're just not putting it away. Like, this isn't enough. And so I guess I never really got truly disappointed because I was always like, eh, I don't know if we got this. And we didn't. And that's okay. Because we got so many more years, baby. Hey, I promise I'm not. Moment, let me go. I promise I'm not a, uh, a butt hurt in asking this question. I'm just genuinely curious because I'm seeing discourse and y'all are more informed than I am on this. Is Brock Purdy a system QB? It's impossible to tell. Like, uh, I mean, it's well that mm. I, I feel like it's one of those things where like almost every QB is a system QB. Like football is a team sport. Like, like Brock Brock Purdy is like yeah he's executing a very good offense that has been successful before him and has like an incredible amount of playmakers but also he's doing a lot better than the other guys that were on that team before him <laughs> he's be- he's doing better than Jimmy Garoppolo did with the same people he's doing better than Trey Lance did in a very small sample he Trey Lance you know famous Dallas Cowboys third stringer <laughs> yeah he <laughs> Like, he is a good quarterback. He is, like, because, you know, it's not like I could go in there and just win with the San Francisco offense. Like, people kind of like to act, like, because the rest of the team is also good, that means that he automatically isn't. 
he's fucking doing every like maybe not last game he didn't have a great yeah, I was game say, he, he had a pretty bad game yeah Packers. but but for the most part like this season and the end of last season he's been doing everything right like he's he's done a good job like would you rather have brock purdy or josh allen like it's not a fucking question like obviously brock purdy is not as good as some of the elite tier quarterbacks in the nfl but he is he's good he is but you will admit that the floor of a quarterback that could succeed in the 49ers system is pretty fucking low like there are a lot of backups that could step into that role and be serviceable and be above replacement level to the point where people would think, yeah, he's maybe we should give him a he's job. Being, he's being elevated by yeah. that team for sure. But like in order to like be elevated that high, like to like, there's no way that he could actually be a shit quarterback that is being buoyed by this amazing team. He's been too good for that. I don't know if shit is ne- like I don't think system quarterback necessarily implies shit. I feel like system quarterback generally implies like average and being placed into onto a I pedestal. Mean, like, the big thing about Jared position. Goff is that he was a system quarterback and he was, but like he's been doing really fucking good outside of that system. Like he he left that system and was still good with the Lions, probably even better. So like does that mean he wasn't actually a system QB? Or does like if you're a system QB, can you operate any system? <laughs> Doesn't that mean you're not a system QB? Well, but it's what we saw with Geno Smith. Like Jared Goff got older and more mature and learned a lot. Like young Jared Goff could very well have been not a very good quarterback in a good system and was elevated because of that. And then he progressed because he was in that system for a long time, learned a lot went to Detroit and was actually able to succeed, even though the system wasn't like perfectly set up for him to succeed because he got enough time learning and maturing and growing and getting better at football. So, I, you know, it, I, that's why I just think it's hard to tell. I don't, I don't want to say definitively Brock Purdy equals system quarterback or right. Brock Purdy equals elite. Like I don't, I don't think yeah, either I, of those. Nah, are... I think he's probably like a mid-level starting NFL quarterback. Like, if you take him out of the 49ers, like I'm sure he wouldn't be as good. But I but I do not think that he would like flounder on a different team. There. There's been too many quarterbacks that have been drafted highly that have completely flamed out. I like for for him to be doing this well and it be of no volition of his own. I was, and that's like the tricky thing about quarterbacks too, right? Like they are so publicly facing, they are so instrumental to a team that it teams will keep like a mediocre or like maybe even kind of bad quarterback because hey at least we know what we're working with here like we get some other guy in and that could it's a complete crapshoot and so often teams fall back on the devil they know yep. that being said i have no idea what happens to justin fields this year where he ends up if anywhere i mean he'll he'll end up somewhere like Send he, him to fucking san francisco no. I'd be fucking curious. <laughs> like, I want to see a thing here. Like, let's do it. Uh, Stafford 2.0. Let's do it. If who knows? Fucking Stafford was a really good QB that was being weighed down by the rest of the team. And everyone kind of knew it. That Stafford was fucking lighting shit up. And Detroit still just couldn't really do anything. That's why he wanted to leave. Everybody knew that, that he was good and was like, you know, kind of needed to get out of Detroit. Mm. It's kind of the opposite of Brock Purdy. <laughs> the anti-Brock Purdy. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to Voluntary Viewing episode 242, which will almost certainly be titled Rebuild of Podcast. If you'd like what you heard, like, comment, subscribe, etc. Check us out Instagram, YouTube, TikTok for highlight clips. Act link in the description. Um, Support us on Patreon. Join the likes of Tiffany Cole and Sucky Badger. Follow us on Twitter at V2 underscore podcast. Uh, send us your questions, viewing at gmail.com. Follow me. I'm Blue Sky. I'm Lucas DeRider there. Don't follow me on Twitter anymore. Get off of Twitter. If you need to get off and you're cool, I can get you a Blue Sky code. Um, outside of that, thank you so much for listening and have a great week. Bye.